Bring 
Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody here. Looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us from the Sunday school time. Looking forward to hearing from y'all for your testimonies or specials this morning. So we do want to go ahead and look at our bulletin note where I don't forget to do all the announcements. The happy birthday this week. Going out to Miss Joyce Bolin, who celebrates on Monday. Youth choir practice today at 5 p.m. Oh, oh, Joyce Griffith's birthday too? What day's your birthday? Wednesday. Wednesday. Joyce Griffith's birthday also on Wednesday, so remember that. And, and Julia's tomorrow. It's not all about you, Julie. Okay, so we got all the J's tomorrow. We got Joyce. <laughs> all right, good, good. Be sure to wish everybody a happy birthday. Um, Thanksgiving banquet will be November 24th, 6 p.m. Please dress up in old, older day fashion. Bring something for the baking contest. Prepare to play old-fashioned games, singing, testifying, and a good old time of Thanksgiving, and a good old-fashioned Thanksgiving dinner. There's a food sign up in the back for you to sign. We also need ladies to volunteer to cook turkey, and we've already got all the volunteers for that. Okay, it's that time of year again. Jam Christmas tree is in the back. Um, it's out there in the foyer instead of in the back of the gym, though. It's in the foyer. Um, that way we didn't tear it up when we was playing um, in the evenings. Um, each ornament has a child's age and grade. If you'd like to help uh, a child this Christmas, please take an ornament and tape it to the present and place the gift underneath the tree. Um, as a reminder, please be sure to do the $10 limit. Um, or if you prefer to donate, please give uh, the, the money to Daniel or Michelle Dunn, and they'll shop for the present. Again, each present is to be $10. Um, presents need to be back under the tree no later than December the 12th. The JAM program, I appreciate your prayers, love, and support. And a little reminder down below that everybody needs to pay attention to. Worried about dying? Don't. Isn't that a nice thing? No, you don't have to worry about dying. You'll live forever. All you have to do is worry about location, location, location. That's the important thing. All righty. Other announcements. Christmas play practice tonight, Mama? For everyone? Okay. So Christmas play practice tonight. Remember, ladies' prayer group on Tuesday, 1030. You want to in prayer for that. If you can come out and join the ladies, they'd more than welcome you there. Other announcements? No? All right. Do we have any specials or testimonies this morning? Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
man. Feathers. Anyone else? You got any other specials this morning? <coughs> yep, we'll look at our prayer request. Bertha McMillian asked prayer for nephew Danny Gill. I'm having surgery I'm on his liver. I also remember Sister Barbara Meadows and family. And Diana Bennett asked prayer for Kathy McKinney with cancer. We'll start over here with our other spoken requests. Any spoken requests on this side? Still remember Shirley and the problems that she has, and Amy, and I have a very special request, but okay. that's all. Jacob, please. Jacob. Our daughter has to have a MRI on her brain to see if she has any more lesions. Okay. So pray for her. My sister asked us to continue to remember her. Her heart rate's only up to 45 right now. And uh, she asked us to pray for her. Okay. Others over here? My buddy, Willie Bowles. Willie Bowles. One of the residents I was taking care of yesterday, um, he has a condition that his peripheral vasculars we're not sure if he had a blood clot. We sent him out to the hospital, and they sent him right back. And I told him I'd lift him up in prayer this week. Okay. Any others? Okay, over here on this side. All right, I'm coming. I want to thank God for his wonderful love, but I had a birthday <laughs> last week. <laughs> 94. Oh, 94 years birthday, okay. Remember Brittany, she's still having some problems and she can't get no doctors to return her call to to see him. So please remember her and remember Kim and her family. They, she's just totally, I don't know, she's out, out. And the girls, I think, want to come to church, but she don't bring them half the time. So please pray, especially for Kaylin and Kendall. I still remember uh, my niece's husband, Bob. He's got uh, fluid in his other lung now, and he just needs lots of prayer, and he's still trusting and saying that he knows God's going to heal him. He still has the hope and faith. And I have some other special requests. Okay. As always, my family for uh, spiritual needs, and uh, I wish we'd take it upon our hearts to remember this country we, we we have all these prayer requests and that's wonderful and we know we have a god that answers but this country needs prayer well we're, we're not going to be able to sit here in this church if we don't start praying and getting the lord to come in and straighten us up or something <laughs> others Others, others, how am I coming? Please remember John in prayer. He wasn't feeling very well this morning. But once again, I'd like to ask you to pray for my sister Brenda and uh, my friend Shirley Bragg, uh, the lady that was is down in Hinton in the nursing home. I also remember my father-in-law, Robert Bragg, for salvation most of all. Uh, Robert's appointment was canceled last Wednesday and moved to Monday. We'll be going to Scott's Depot to the Orthopedic Center. Um, remember him in prayer and also for his salvation. And also um, I have a friend Sandra Harmons. Her son 
needs a heart transplant, but he was so bad that they had to go ahead and operate on his existing heart. So I don't know all the situation there, but um, I know Sandra's a question. Christian, I don't know about her son, but please remember him. Yeah. Any others? Okay, over here. Prayer requests. You got one? Okay. <laughs> please remember Paulette and her health. Her hip is really, really bad. Facing surgery. Probably needs to lose a lot of weight, which I don't know how it's going to happen. I'll just leave it in the Lord's hands. And please, my brother asked for prayer yesterday evening as I was leaving. Sure. And I remember Patty and I, she's got a appointment in UVA this week, and I got five here. Sure. Remember us. Okay, anyone else? I remember me and my sons lost some Lon Rogers family, those in a nursing home. My sister in law, Eva Bragg, she goes tomorrow to see a Parkinson's doctor. And remember Linda Miller, she had went to Wake Forest this, this past week. They're going to start her on iron treatments up here at the Cancer Center. And remember um, Marty Brewer, she has fourth stage cancer. Remember her and her family. And remember my cousin Janice, she stays in pain all the time. They also still remember her son. And I have a very special and special one too, please. Okay, anyone else? Always remember the spiritual needs of our family, please, our children. And Jordan and I were out yesterday, along with everybody in the pastor's family, we were out door knocking and stuff. And Jordan and I talked to a uh, a lady named Nancy. It's Jonathan's grandmother. And uh, I would like the church to remember that family in prayer. She she would like the pastor to come and talk to her, uh, but not her husband because he would get angry. So let's let's pray that God would soften that man's heart. I'm not sure what his name is, but let's pray God would soften his heart and maybe accept Jesus as a Savior. Okay, anybody else? Susie? Uh, my sister-in-law, my oldest sister-in-law, um, has cancer. She's 86 years old, so please pray for her. And I don't know about her salvation. She says she's saved, but I don't, I don't know for sure. That was your oldest sister-in-law? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, anybody else? Well, Brent, I got a couple of kids in my neighborhood. Uh, they need to come to church. I have one coming to church. It's a bigger cousin than the other. So now he's not going to go. Oh, gotcha. Another one? Okay. Okay. Irene Atkins, okay. And Charlie Sanuto. Okay, anybody else? Your family? Okay. Okay, Brother Carlos, will you lead us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning to thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for your love and your mercy, Lord, that you so graciously bestow upon us. We ask your blessings here upon each one of these that are present here this morning. We ask you both physically and spiritually, Lord, that you will continue to lead God and direct in their lives. Encourage them during this seems to be sad times that are going all around us, Lord. Maybe we continue to look to you and continue to be encouraged in our Christian walk. We ask your special blessing upon each one of these prayer requests we've heard here this morning, each name that's been mentioned, each special request, and especially those that are lost, Lord. We ask you to go there and to touch, heal them, Lord, and whatever it takes, for you know each need. We ask your guide and directions. Be with the teachers downstairs as they go stand before the children. Guide and direct and everything that's set up here with Brother Marty. Give him the message that we stand here before you in need of. Guide and direct us. We'll give you the praise, the honor, the glory for it all. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. All right.
All righty. Have we had any anniversaries in the last week? No anniversaries? Well, if you've had a birthday in the last week and like to come forward and celebrate with us, you're more than welcome. If not, everybody stand, greet one another, and sing number 219. 219. Two hundred nineteen. We're going to sing first verse, the last verse. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Two hundred nineteen. Sing out with me. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace, our sin and our guilt yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured. There where the blood of the Lamb was shed. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace have cleansed within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. Marvelous, infinite, you that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace and grace, grace, God's grace. Grace it is and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace. All righty, you may be seated. Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, and we'll continue on. We were talking, have been talking uh, for some weeks. Last week we took a little break, Brother Andy. Uh, taught Sunday school, and we really enjoyed that. That was a real good challenge for us. Now we're back into um, the subject matter of churches, the enemies of churches, that which is, becomes an enemy of the church. The church by itself, just, you know, if it was just left alone, it would be a, a force to be reckoned with. Uh, however, um, Satan attacks it from the outside, tempts it from the inside, and there's a lot of movement, a lot of activity that takes place. Sadly enough, uh, we don't realize that. You know, we, we still feel like we're fighting against flesh and blood. We still feel like it's her, it's him, it's it, and so forth. And not understanding that the true enemy is Satan who is working to bring destruction to minimize the church is a better way to say it, to minimize the church. So he'll never be able to overthrow a church, uh, the church at large, but he certainly can render a church useless. And that, that's, that's what um, we were referring to this morning. If a church can't be used, if a church in turn is not, doesn't have influence, then why does the body exist anyway? Um, you know, um, I was was thinking about my friend, Pastor Sears, and, uh, you know, Lord only knows all this obviously has been brought in his life. But that's a helpless feeling. You know, if, if he in turn sustains this, uh, this paralysis, then it limits him. My grandmother called me yesterday, and this is a pretty regular conversation. I was on my way over here to church, and she called, and she talked, and she started crying. And she said, Marty, she said, I didn't think I'd live this long. And she said, I don't know what the use is me even living anyway. I just sit here in a chair. I'm no good for anybody. You know, I'm, I'm not doing anything, and so forth. And, and uh, I listened to her, and I thought, not that it's true. I'm not saying that it's true but she doesn't have influence as she had in the past. And she feels as though she's been rendered useless. 
And she's figured out real quick that life is not about what you eat or what you drink or what you wear. Used to, that's consumed her life, what she ate, drink, and wore, but she was doing things involved. And now some of those things have been taken away, and now all she has to do is eat, drink, and find something to wear. And she feels like life doesn't have a purpose. And that's what Satan can do to a church. Bring it to a point to where they just eat, drink, and something to wear. And that's it. And sadly is that a lot of congregations are okay with that. I mean, they, they, they're accepting of that. They, they, they're okay with the fact that they've just, the church has been moved into retirement. And so this is what Satan wants, because Satan, in turn, has no power over the church. We are the body of Christ. He has no power over us. And so to paralyze us in some way, to, to render us unable, inactive, useless in some way, is the greatest thing that he can do against the church. And he's constantly working, working on that to bring this about. You're in Revelation chapter number 2. All right, Revelation chapter 2, are you there? Say amen. All right, now notice here it says, uh, this church of Ephesus, um, unto the church, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in the right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, and know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. And so we'll stop there. Father, we pray you'll give us a guidance in the Sunday school lesson tonight. And please be with the young people and the teachers as they're having their lessons as well. We love you and thank you. You're so good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We talked about enemies, and I won't go through all the ones we've discussed at this point. But I wanted to pull this passage out and, and talk for a moment about the church of Ephesus and how this church, in turn, had no patience. They were intolerant toward any type of, you know, negative, you know, uh, influence in the church or false doctrine in the church. And in verse number two, the Lord Jesus recognized that. He said, I know thy works and thy labor and patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. In this given case, there were some false prophets that had influenced the, <clears throat> influenced the church, and they dealt with it. Now, we understand that, that the ending of this church, their testimony, was that God threatened to remove them out of the candlestick. And I believe we, we discussed that briefly. If we liken this to a candlestick, this is the church. This is the church right here. The church is given a light, and this church is placed in a position of authority to be used. Influence. A place of influence in an area. And God is the one that gives that. And God, we see in scriptures, he threatened to take churches off of the candlestick and no longer use them anymore. They have no more position of authority and they're no longer an influence. And so this church of Ephesus, as along with three other ones here in, and these are real churches of that day, these churches are threatened um, rebuked by God and are threatened that God would remove them out of the candlestick from the candlestick but he said I want I want you to know that I recognize that you have an intolerant spirit toward those ones who are false now this is something that we need in our churches we need it and it and Satan hits us from a thousand different directions you know it hits us from the outside and from the inside uh, trying to in any way he can to neutralize to paralyze us to take away our zeal to, you know, to, to somehow to, to entangle us with sin in some way or another that we in turn are render useless, that we're taken out of the candlestick because he has, he has nothing. He can't, he can't combat the light of the gospel, lest the light of the gospel, the glorious gospel, shine into them and they be saved. He can't combat that. And so somehow he has to try to remove that light, extinguish the light, remove the light of the camp, something. And intolerance is one, a tolerant spirit is one way. Now, we, <laughs> we live in a day of tolerance, you know. It's, um, it's fascinating, you know. It's, it's wrong for me anymore to have an opinion, you know. I, and 
this has a lot to do with, um, um, oh, the word just escaped me. A word, um, oh, just escaped me. Oh, radical egalitarianism. It has a lot to do with that because we celebrate everybody's individuality. We no longer can be, we no longer can have opinions and in turn have a, any kind of intolerance toward anything or anybody else. You know, it's my family, these are my children, and I don't mean mine as I possess them, but God has certainly put me in responsibility over them, so I'm going to decide what touches them, influences them, and so forth, and I'm going to teach them what's right and wrong according to the Scriptures, and that is in turn to be, a, to be intolerant. And that, that's the basis of why many Christians that are marked, that they are marked because they're intolerant. Well, the church should be a place to where uh, there is a spirit of intolerance. Uh, if we had, uh, we were living in a house and uh, we had a fence in the backyard and we're walking on the yard considering this house, we're going to buy this house and we see some one or two rattlesnakes that are going around the backyard. If we were to buy the house and live there, I, I imagine we would probably be very intolerant about those rattlesnakes being there. One house uh, my wife and I purchased some years back, I had a swim pool in the backyard. Not, not a fancy one, but it was, a, it was an above ground pool and it was well built, taken care of and so forth. And she said, I do not want that pool in that backyard. She said, I don't want it, you know. And she said, I'm just so afraid of one of the kids. Um, yeah, I won't see him or watch him and, and he'll somehow fall into it and it'll drown. And she said, I don't want that at all. And so the first thing we did is we, after we bought purchased the house, is we removed the swim pool and took it out. He said, that, that's intolerance. The, the swimming pool, in turn, posed a danger for what was important to her and what was important to me, but obviously she was the one uh, that was far more um, worried, concerned about it, and so she wanted that to be removed. Well, an intolerant spirit inside the church, there is right and wrong. There are those things which are there are holiness and those things which are not holiness. You know, there's right and wrong in everything. And somehow the lines have been so skewed between right and wrong that we don't even know what right and wrong. In fact, right and wrong is probably more defined by how you feel or what you want. Maybe situational ethics have finally won out. The situation determines. And But there is right and wrong. And these these elements, these humanistic teaching uh, that's satanically driven. You know, we know it's out there, and it's out there. We just don't want it in here. Can I get amen on that? We don't want it in here. And we're not here so we can judge them. We're here so that we, in turn, can be right before God and be a witness when we go outside of these doors. We don't want it in here to be just like it's out there. And an in, a tolerant spirit will make us exactly what's out there. That's what will happen. You, know, you can gather, and, uh, you know, we may say we're a church, but, uh, you know, but in turn, what makes us a church is not the fact that we have a name on the outside. What makes us a church is the fact that Christ lives within us and that we have been so chosen, qualified by God to be in the candlestick. That's what makes us a church. Otherwise, we're just a gathering. We're just an assembly. We're, that's, that's all that we are. And so this uh, intolerant spirit or this tolerant spirit can, uh, can really, really, really offend to the church. And we see this. Look, if you will. I know we've mentioned this uh, last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But I want to elaborate on this a little bit more. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. The church of Corinth is called, is often referred to as the worldly church. Um, and they, they had a lot of problems. Now, uh, Corinth itself was a cesspool. The culture was a cesspool. And they had serious, degraded religious uh, uh, institutions there. They, they were very much just the, the uh, polycultural uh, atmosphere of Corinth had created just almost like a no-boundary type of culture there in Corinth itself. And when we read the Corinth, when we read in Corinth, uh, the book of Corinthians, about even issues about unsaved people being married to saved people, some of that we don't quite grasp. But 
if you got an idea of what was going on in Corinth, then you could better understand why he wrote about it. Because their culture, in turn, had no bars hold. Anything was allowed. We, in turn, have a lot of ungodliness in our culture, but what's left in our culture, there's, I mean, there's still a little bit of a residue of a Victorian culture of the past. You know, we, we have a little bit of that in the past. When the church in the past had influence, we have a little bit of that. And so there's a little bit of understanding because grandma and grandpa, they didn't. And we have a little bit of that understanding. But, but in turn, the, the culture fully accepted, and, and I want to be discreet in what I'm saying, they fully accepted everything. Can you shake your head? You kind of just get my idea? It was bad. Okay, so now there's a man in the church, and this is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, and here we see um, uh, verse, number, uh, verse number 5, it says, To deliver such a one into Satan for destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, for your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? What is he talking about? Verse number 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not to, to much as named among the Gentiles, that no one should have his father's wife. Okay, so fornication is always, adultery and fornication are not necessarily the same classification. classification. Adultery is fornication, but fornication is not necessarily adultery. In this case, this man is not married, but he in turn is having relationships with his father's wife, who obviously is not his mother, but it's his father's wife. And I'm going to read in the pages, I don't know this to be true, but just what I've learned about the culture, uh, that the father was probably okay with this because they were okay with those things anyway. So his father in turn has a wife, which he in turn is intimate with, and his son is also have an intimacy with his father's wife, which is his stepmother. And this guy comes to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night he's in their congregation. And, and he in turn is not hiding it. You know, he's, he's, um, you know he's, he's not purposely maybe trying to broadcast it, but he's not hiding it. It's just what he's going to do. You know, it's my life, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And you just need to leave my, you know, nobody's going to tell me what I can do and I can't do. And, and you know, all this you know, rules and regulations and you can't do this and you can't do that and, and so forth. You know what? And Jesus is about grace. And I got saved and all my sins have been forgiven. All that garbage. It's just a bunch of trash that is spoken. And this church had come to the point where they were glorying. How in the world could you glory? Verse number six. How could you glory in the fact that you have a man in your church that is enjoying intimate relationships with his mother. He knows it. Obviously, he knows it. The church knows it. His father knows it. It's all known. Everybody knows it. And nobody's condemning it at all. And the church is saying, boy, they're glorying in this. And the church is saying this. You know what? We've got an open mind. You know, people are just different. I mean, some people are made this way and some are made that way. And, and you know, I couldn't do what he does. But, you know, uh, but I'm... I'm turned, it just, that's not that, who am I to judge him? You know, for what he's going through, what he's, you know, his circumstances is different and so forth. And, and all of that conversation, all of that conversation had resulted in them being very proud about their ability to accept someone who was involved in something of that matter. There are churches today that do the same exact thing. They'll, they'll allow people in their congregation that in turn are living lifestyles that are completely, I mean, 180 degrees adjacent to what Scripture teaches. And they, they in turn have relationships with those people and involve them and use them and so forth and so on, knowing, and I, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying this because I have, need something to say. I, I just, there's too many stories and the fact that things are recorded, I would not, you know, I don't want it to ever be uh, heard again that I'm talking about situations someone may know. I mean, the things I've heard, it's just like what Paul said here. These things should never be named amongst the church of God. And here Paul said the Gentiles, the unsaved people out there, they don't even do what you're doing. And you've allowed this in the church. And the churches 
they, this happens. I mean, churches like ours, that the same thing happens, that they somehow glory in the fact that they are intolerant or that they're tolerant about sin. Now look, that, that, that will destroy this church. It'll destroy any church. We don't want to be judgmental. We're not trying to get a one-size-fits-all. You know, we, we want to have, allow people to have room to grow in grace. But having said those things, we, we in turn can't, we can't have rattlesnakes that are crawling around inside the church either. We've got to deal with those issues. And if we in turn see or experience or know that there's such a case inside the church, then it must be dealt with because that threatens the very vitality of us as a church. You know, you say, well, I'll just, I'll just not pay attention to it. I'll just not get involved. Well, if you don't get involved, then eventually it's going to get involved with you. That's what will happen. And so there's no way around that. And this church here was, uh, was very, uh, very um, intolerant about those things. And, and I do emphasize here that they were intolerant, but they also had lost their first love. And so I won't get into that right now. Look, if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you're in 1 Corinthians 5. And so having a spirit of tolerance, that's an enemy of the church. And we've, we want to have a spirit about us, just as we talked about last week, that we're, we're, we're ready, if need be, that we will deal with sin in our church. I dare say, I dare say that anybody here, and if you have, tell me after church, I'd like to know. But I dare say that any of you here today have ever been in a church, a part of a church where someone was disciplined. I have been in church since I was a kid, you know, since I was a young teenager, and I have never never been a part of that until I became a pastor and I executed myself. And, that, and it didn't come to the point where I had to bring it in front of the church. But I've never even been a part of a church that practiced church discipline. Pretty important. It's in scriptures. A tolerant spirit. Now, obviously there's, you know, there's, we're not trying to arm the church as the police to go around and to you know, at times I'll jest when I go to people's house and say, this is a pastor check. I'm checking your house out. You know? <laughs> and I'm jesting. You know, I'm, I'm, that's not how we live our life. But if you're living in blatant, open sin, disobeying against God, creating disunity inside the church, you're wagging your tongue, you're involved in sin. I mean, you're involved in gross sin and, you're, and not repenting of it. The church has a responsibility to deal with it because your life is going to affect someone else's and eventually is going to take us out of the candlestick. We don't, I don't say we, but the church doesn't have the, the, the church lacks the boldness to preach the gospel. You think they have the boldness to practice church discipline? Let me put my glasses on so I can see your face. I'm being serious. We lack the boldness to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, which frees people from sin. Do you think we really have the boldness to practice church discipline? I remember the first time that I dealt with someone marked them, as the scripture says, in a church service. Oh, man, everybody was uncomfortable. And afterwards, I had several people talk to me about it. They were scared. They were afraid. They thought we were starting a cult. I said, it's just scriptures. It's just what the Bible says. Oh, what, what do you suggest we do? I mean, what's your recommendation? Just love them. Just love them. Well, you go ahead and love them outside the church walls. We're not going to love them inside the church walls living like that. Anyway, that's enough of that. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 10. And it says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, that, that, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind. <laughs> I wonder if there was any women in this church that he's writing about here. The same mind and in the same judgment. And for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Uh, now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Paulus, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. And so uh, this next, we're talking about enemies of the church, and here's the next one, something we've, we've, 
touched on, you know, off and on since I've been here as a pastor, is the idea of division or the lack of unity that's inside of the church. Again, the church of Corinth, they had all types of difficulties and problems. And, and this was only one of the many that was terribly, terribly, terribly divided in the church. And they divided themselves amongst personalities. Their division in turn was amongst, was divided. They were divided among those ones who spiritually they followed. Well, one would follow those ones who followed Paul and those ones who followed Apollos and those ones who followed Cephas. And, and each one of them, no doubt, had a different emphasis. They all served the same God. They planted and watered and God gave the increase, but it created division inside the church because their loyalty was not in the same place. They were not loyal to the same person. Their loyalty was not to the same institution, not to the same body, and therefore they found themselves divided. Now we know as families, uh, they, you know, families tend to be clicky. Um, and my daughter and I were talking about this very matter, a book she was reading, and I believe your family should. There should be an unusual, you know, love and and commitment and and loyalty that you have to your family. It's not that you, it's not that you are, you know, that you're against other families, but your responsibility is your family. You know, I, I'm directly responsible for my family and my children, and God placed them in my home, and God gave, my, gave Joe to me, and, and I have responsibility, and so it should be that I prefer her and my children. I should prefer them. Somehow it's become wrong for us to prefer anything. I can't prefer, you know, I can't prefer my church over. I can't prefer my children over. I can't even prefer, you know, you know, the culture that I'm a part of. I can't prefer anything. Somehow it's wrong today. Well, I mean, families should be that way. They, they should have some type of preference uh, that they prefer, and, and that's natural. That's natural. But when we come inside of a church setting, church setting, all of us individual families, we have got to lead our own families so that there's unity amongst us. And that unity is not going to be, come about because we, in, that we magnify our individuality or our preferences, but that we find that which unifies us, and that is that our loyalty is to the body, our loyalty is to the head, our loyalty is to Jesus Christ. And we keep that loyalty there. You know, inside of the house, uh, and we, we see this. My kids didn't choose, they didn't choose to have me as their father or to have Joe as their mother. And Joe and I, um, you know, we're, we're unique, just like every person is unique. And she and I have learned to find unity. She is different. She and I will oftentimes say how different. We are as opposite as two people are. I'm honest that we are. We're so opposite. And yet we've found unity and the kids in turn have, have had to grow up, you know, with all of that. And we're not perfect. I'm not a model of anything. And, and my wife and I, we in turn oftentimes, we beat ourselves up because we want to do things better. But you know, our kids don't really have much choice, do they? This is all they have is mom and dad. And they, they've got to somehow figure out how to find unity inside the home where, they're, where they live. And that unity is not going to be found because they, in turn, pull away from the family. I remember talking to uh, Joy, and Joy is, I mean, Joy, I think Joy could t tame a rattlesnake. She's just, just such a peaceful person, and she's uh, very meek-spirited. But Joy, uh, I was talking to her one day about a relationship inside the house, and I said to her, I said, look, you know, the world doesn't revolve around you. This person may be different than you, and you may in turn struggle, and you may want this person to come over and help and serve you, and whatever may be the case, and, and all of that. And I said, but if you're going to have a relationship with that person, I said, it, it all de depends upon what you do to have that relationship. What are you going to do about it? And you're waiting for that person to do this and that, and you feel like that person should do this and that and so forth. But I'm telling you that, that you... You have found yourself creating disunity in the family because you're not unified with that person. And that's what happens in churches. We all kind of divide up and so forth. You know, I don't, it's just like it or lump it. If we're a body, we're a body. 
and inside of the body you have some people that are that that are very peaceful and meek and uh, you know and then you have Miss Jewel you know and you have people like that you know oh she didn't hear it she, she walked out on us <laughs> and you have some people that in turn are you know they're just they're fun and loving and other people are are instigators I mean you've got all that and so if you're going to have unity then in turn we unify based upon Jesus Christ in fact, that's exactly what Scripture encourages us to do. Ephesians chapter 4, and, and you can turn there and look if you like, four, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, verse 31 and 32. We know obviously that Jesus commanded us this when he gave us the great commandment, that we love people as we love ourselves. We understand that the whole, the whole idea of living the Christian life is so that God fills you with love, and that love, His love, is what you give to other people. It's never been about me. It's always been about Him. And I become a vessel to love other people, people that He loves. And you know, people are not lovely, but yet He gives us love to give to other people. Inside of a church should be, it should be just a bastion of love. I mean, it should just be seen, the acceptance, the, the approval, the, just the the embracing, you know, the, the love, the support. But yet, even in a church our size, it can be distinguished by cliques. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'll never be a part of clique. I'll love the poorest, and I'll love the richest. I'll love the one that's an instigator, and I'll love the one that in turn is meek and quiet in spirit. I'll love the one that's in leadership, and I'll love the one that isn't. I'll love a bus kid, and I'll love an you know, elderly lady that sits on a pew. I won't be a part of a clique. I'll love all of you. And, and don't try to pull me into a clique, because I won't be a part of it. I'm not going to separate you because you are a clique, but I'm not going to separate to you in your clique. And if you have a clique, then you need to repent of that and get over it because you're harming the church. The whole church is your family. And there are those ones who maybe you have a kindred spirit with, and I get it, they're people, friends that help you on your journey, but the whole church is your family. And you enjoy the whole church. And this disunified, whenever there's cliques inside the church, and this is what happens, then, then it's the perfect environment for offenses and battle to take place. I dare say that's happened in the past. You're awful quiet there. I don't have any knowledge. I just know from being in churches. And you know, there's a, it's hard when you have a family that works to be unified together. We all see each other's fault. This one has a bad attitude. This one here speaks too much. This one right here is a little procrastinator. This one here is that, this one that. We all that. We all know that who we are, but we all are a part of a family and we're working together and to condemn that person is to condemn myself. And that's exactly what we do when we condemn ourselves. You condemn this person over here, it's just, you're just condemning yourself. You're the idiot that decided to be a part of this church family. You know, if you criticize your wife, can I mind you, you're the one who decided to marry her. I mean, who are you really criticizing? You speak bad about your husband. Who are you really, you're really saying, I'm the most stupid person ever born. I mean, I went out and found, you know, you and I married you. That's what you're really criticizing yourself. I mean, how intelligent is that? But it shows the disunity. You separated from somebody, therefore you can criticize them. You have a relationship with somebody, you have eliminate those cliques, it's hard to criticize them. Now you may see their faults. You may see them, but it's hard to criticize them because you're a part of them. And to criticize them is to criticize yourself. And so uh, it doesn't mean, you know, my wife and I, we first were married, I, went out and bought one of those motivational posters. You'd have to just you'd have to be a fly on the wall in her house to understand why I did this. But I bought one of those motivational posters. This is probably a two weeks after we got married. And it was the picture of the guys, the pair the guys jumping out of the airplane with parachutes. And some are green, some are yellow, some are orange, you know, some are red. And they jumped out and they're falling and uh, there's multiple pictures, but the last picture shows all of them holding each other's hands and all the yellows together, all the reds are together, all the blues are together, all the greens together, except for one guy who's red and he's in with the yellow. And I got that picture and I hung it up on our, in our, somewhere in our house and it says teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. Well, that's a, that's a, 
you know, that's a secular saying, but it's true. That unity in turn is what, in, what enables God to flow His power through the church. It, it, is no, it is no mystery that when they all came together in one accord, Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, then the Spirit of God descended upon them. And I would dare say this way, that whenever they lose one accord, the Spirit of God leaves them. Now we may come and sing songs, and we may hold a Bible, and we may have preaching, we may go through all the motions, but, but God's Spirit is that fluid, it's that Spirit of love that binds all of us together, that, that in turn gives the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all of that, that makes church, as Paul, as David said, oh, he said, it's good when we dwell together with unity. And, and can I just go a little step farther and say this? I would not be content with the fact that someone, in turn, that you're upset with someone or someone's upset with you. I would never be content with that. You know, if you, in turn, have some kind of position of leadership and you've offended some people because of that, I would not be content with the fact and just let it be. I would make the effort, I encourage you to make the effort to resolve that. At the very least, agree to disagree. But let it not be that their offenses are tolerated between you and somebody else. Deal with those offenses. And so, very real. And there's no way, there is just no way, there's no way that people can dwell together, whether it's two people in a marriage, or a handful of people in the family, or a congregation of people as we have. There is no way that this can happen except for there are constant opportunities for us to be divided toward each other. And so unity doesn't happen on accident. It happens on purpose. Somebody has, somebody has to say, I'm going to be unified. And I'm going to make sure this church stays unified. Somebody's inside the family. Somebody has to say that. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, of course, Joe knows this, you know. I don't tolerate it in our house. I'm not going to have it. We'll stay up all night long, talk all night long. I mean, we're, if there's a division, we're going to take care of it. It's going to be solved. We're not going on, you know, going on with dividedness inside of the home. We're going to deal with it. And so we've got to protect that because disunity, in turn, is a foothold that Satan gets in churches and in families, but in churches, what I'm referring to, and just tears them apart. All right. I'm going to stop right there. Looking forward to tonight, and tonight will be in Acts chapter number 6, and so I encourage you, you may read it. I'm going to go walk to the back door. Um, if you could, uh, let's not walk out this door right now because the, we're having trouble with the mechanism there. I think it needs to be fixed. So if you can, just go out the main doors. Okay, so with that in mind, if you'll stand, Brother Ricky, why don't you dismiss us in prayer.